Hello, this is Russell from Homes of Evil. And you're listening to Capes and Lunatics. Hi, this is Phil, and I'm here to tell you all about the Capes and Lunatics Patreon. Don't miss out on our comic book creator interviews, including our monthly Chichester chats with comic book legend D.D. Chichester, superhero movie brackets, and our search for the worst comic book movie of all time, and many, many more specials, all completely uncensored. Access starts for $3 a month, full video when you pledge $5 a month. Check out the link in our show notes or go to patreon.com slash capesandlunatics. Hope to see you there. This is Luca Parrish, and you're listening to the Capes and Lunatics podcast. The recording has started. In a world of capes and lunatics, gods and monsters, some threats are too great for one hero to face alone. In those times, will rise a team, a team of Avengers. And this is Avengers Declassified. I'm your host, Charlie, the Professor Esser, and with me, as always, is the Blue-Eyed Bomber from the Burger Pits. Phil Podcast Parish. Hey, welcome, Philip. Today, we are discussing the Bloodstone Saga. Yes. In which the... Okay, Helmet Zemo. Um, trying not to make him so much of a Nazi even back then, but still kind of a Nazi. Uh, and very much in the MCU, that guy's a total Nazi. Don't fall for the hype. Mm-hmm. Um, he is uh, he is attempting to find the pieces of the Bloodstone. The legendary Bloodstone, once held by Ulysses' Bloodstone, until it was shattered and uh, wackiness ensued as they say in the business. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's very interesting to me because what's most interesting to me is I got these books delivered third-class mail, third-class uh, print media mail back in the day, back before the comic book shops were a thing, you see. Uh, and I read every one of these, and it, uh, it amazed me how poor my memory of this story was. Oh, really? Yes. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's... Oh wow! I totally misremembered this entire scene, and it's it's very different, but it's still fun, and it's still enjoyable in its own right. Um, I don't know. Do you want to go issue by issue, or do you want to just take it as a as a as a whole of a piece? You can take it as a whole. That's fine. Yeah, because I mean, really, in this story, we are see, and this is this is back when man, I, and I forgot about backup stories. Mm-hmm. And uh, and if you're listening to Capes and Lunatics this week. Uh, you will hear a lot about backup stories because uh, our ghost hunter stories, it's all double issues. That's a lot of stories to tell. Well, those, were, repr- those were reprints, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, they're, but they're like double issues. They're like two stories in one. So well, yeah, they put, they put two of the old issues in one. seven issues you made me read. You made me read 14 issues. I know, I know. And this was just seven issues, but yeah, but, you know, also with the backup stories, which are their own interesting subplot i suppose um but anyway getting back to the getting back to the actual story um so uh we open up with a heist as you do and that is in and what's interesting is that's the end of the first story beginning of the new story um uh we have the bloodstone heist by helmet zemo and his gang of evildoers where they're taking the bones of the original Ulysses Bloodstone, famous monster hunter, um, and they're going to use these to find the pieces of the Bloodstone for a nefarious purpose we do not have yet revealed. But of course, evil woman that she is, uh, Diamondback, partner of Captain America at this point, um, well, not really a partner, but sort of the uh, an associate of Captain America at this point, um, is uh, is um, also trying to get a score. Because she sees, oh, they're going to steal something must be valuable. I'll let them do the heavy lifting, then I'll steal it myself. Or something along those lines. Um, she gets in there. She realizes it's Batrock, Machete. Oh, who's the other guy? Uh, is it Weapons Master or something? So, uh, yeah. yeah, but... 
Yeah, but it's like yeah, it's 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 it, 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 it's a wonderful gaggle of uh, low rent supervillains. Your villains for hire, if you will, <laughs> um, and they are uh, they are um, being uh, they are doing this heist, and when they catch Diamondback. They basically throw her down a big hole. Oh yeah, that is that is that is the end of that story. Um, not really the end, but it, but at least a, a, a portion of it. Um, and one could very easily argue that um, you know, uh, you know, it's 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 quite it's quite a cliffhanger ending that we will f- pick up on in the next issue when when uh, Diamondback uses her emergency cap communicator. Mm-hmm. You know, which you gotta have. You always gotta have emergency communicators like that in the superhero ind- industry. If Jimmy Olsen has taught us nothing, it is that you need a way to contact your superhero in any situation in a moment's notice. This isn't like a Star Trek combat that is gonna get interference from every uh, silicate crystal cave. Well, she gave him one when you know when he was the captain, and she's like, "I hope he kept the I kept the I hope he kept a hold of it. Otherwise, you know." Yeah. But I do have to. I do have to admire how well it does communicate through. Mm-hmm. Again, big deep holes. Uh, under New York, yeah. Under New York, yes. You know, um, yeah. And honestly, if you've ever been in a subway in New York, and that's even you that's know, low, aren't even, even that deep, and they're like, you know, you, you can't get a signal. So that's some good technology, whatever they're using. Um, and uh, and I, it's just nice to see Diamond back again, as as always. We do love Diamond back. Um, oh yeah. And Cap comes to find her, of course. Um, and fortunately, there was a major updraft on the on the on the uh, on the hole. So she fell, but she fell gently. That's always helpful when you fall gently. Oh yeah. Um, once again. But yeah, I mean, this thing was fun. Uh... Yeah, sorry. Not Children good. trying to cook, and I'm trying to do a podcast. It's okay. Um, so yes. Anyway, Philip, you begin. <laughs> what? Oh no. I mean, yeah. I, I I like this story. Uh, yeah, Cap has to go through this whole chamber to find her, and I guess I guess it's from like an old rampaging Hulk. Uh, a couple. Because I don't know if you ever read that thing. Uh, there was always a Hulk story, and then there was another story. That's where all, all that Ulysses Bloodstone stuff was from, I think. And uh, because yeah. like. Some of Moon Knight's old appearances were from there. Yeah, and 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 to be fair, I I wonder if Ulysses Bloodstone was as much of a jerk as they kind of make him out to be in this. Um, well, he's one, you know, he's one of those guys, you know, with that old comic book trope. You know, he was a uh, early man who finds a, me- a meteor or something and uh, gets Im- immortality, like many people yeah. in comics. Okay. Um, Yes, so so they get out. They realize that uh, the, that Zemo and his crew searching for the Bloodstones, and we're going to follow them through several adventures. And one of the things I like about this is this is really this is actually one of the really good episodes where they um, start to humanize the villains. Mm-hmm. You know, in fact, I will really uh, this is a good one to point to when Batroc stopped being. Stop being a henchman and became a goon. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was one of the, there was something, I think, that, was it Harley Quinn who recently did that or something else where there was like about the difference between being a goon, being a hired goon, and being a henchman. Like henchmen actually are into it. Like whatever the boss says, they're very loyal and they're all a part of it. Yeah. But like a goon, it's just, they're just, they're just there for the paycheck, man. You know? And Batrock you know, originally is actually kind of an evil guy when he first appears. He's like part of the, you know, Vichy government and all that kind of stuff. He's totally, totally down with the Red Skull. And by this point, he's like, nah, man, I'm just totally, I just work for whoever, you know. You want to pay me to to be your guy who jumps around? I'm your jump around guy. Um, and that and that continues. And, and I think that when we get to our later interpretations in um, in uh, Gwenpool that like that characterization kind of starts here. So that that's a cool thing because we're going to see that throughout this issue where there is this effort to humanize um, 
humanize uh, Batroc. Batroc in the same way that you know we're very much humanizing uh, Diamondback and the rest of the serpents, you know, as just people who are working for a living. Now, is this? Yeah. So, was this the one with the serpent saucer? Or was that one of the other books we read recently? Uh, that was the one with Scourge, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so that was a different one. Um, no, remember, okay. th- this is when we meet Cap, Cap gets his new pilot, John Jameson. Yes, John Jameson. I, I am very happy to see John Jameson. Um, I am very happy to to have him a part of this story. Um, it is going to come back. They're going to reference, uh, you know, Man Wolf later. Oh, yeah. Um, which, is, which is good. Which is good. I like when I like that they gave John Jameson really random occasional powers. Like that will come out later. Like it's one of these things that it's like, oh well, I guess. Oh, why don't I just remember that I can turn into Man Wolf and you know do that thing? But that doesn't happen in this story. But they do reference that time that he turned into a Man Wolf, not a Wolf Man, a Man Wolf, because uh, he's a little less feral. Um, anyway, um, yeah, I don't, since I don't have the physical issues and I don't have my phone with me, I'm trying to remember, like, what, what, what is the cover of each issue? Because we do all of the tropes in this. We do the undersea adventure. We do the, oh, that's right, that's the uh, Temple of Doom adventure. Yep. Yes, the Temple of Doom, uh, where we, we, uh, meet the, and it's in Columbia, as I recall. And the the chief of the secluded tribe uh, has the has the piece of the bloodstone in his mask, um, and they use Kirari. Yeah, they all get captured. Yeah, Cap, yeah, Diamondback, all the vi- yeah the villains. Yeah, and Cap has to yes. free everybody. Yeah, and and I love the fact that you know Super Soldier Serum stronger than Kirari. So you got to appreciate that. You know. Yeah, she's like getting my heart pumping. He's like, come on, come on. Come on, you can do this, you know, which is also in its own way kind of silly um, when mm-hmm. you think about it. Um, just because, like, why should why should he be? I guess Super Soldier Serum just trumps everything, or just like just that force of superheroic will. But it works; it happens. He does it. Um, well, I mean, is it more believable than the rest of the any of the rest of them getting over it? You know, quickly. <laughs> Well, I guess the idea is that it does wear off, and the other people had been curried for a while. Like I, we see that Diamondback is still completely out of it by the end of it, you know. So, um, you know, although I do, you know, you talk about, uh, you, you can talk about like things that don't always age well, and <laughs> Temple of Doom right up there. Um, we're, great story, great fun, great adventure, but you know. Although I will give that they're like, yeah, we're going to kill these these white guys because, well, everything white people have done to our people for the last thousand years. So, you know, it makes some sense. Well, again, I mean, look, they ca- attack Cap and Diamondback because who were the first people there? Zemo and his crew. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and to be fair, you know, um, but again, I think that they got the drop on Zemo and his crew, too, which, again, kind of, you know, kind of puts the lie to the. To the whole Zemo built better kind of concept, you know, um, it's just you know maybe he's not as good of a leader as he thinks he is. Maybe he likes to think he's a good leader, but really he's kind of maybe a less good leader. That's my theory. I don't know. Um, uh, but yeah, they do get out of that. They do get the we start and we start our Bloodstone. Our Bloodstone quest, you know, because that's what we're doing. We're trying to get our Bloodstone quest, and that's what we're working towards. Um, yeah, and then the next one was that underwater one, you know, where the fragment oh, was yes. in, like, a down the air liner under, in the ocean, yeah. Yes, and that's that's kind of cool in its own right, too. Um, I like the fact that, um, and again, this is where we see um, Batroc saving the day, as it were, you know? He... Stabs the shark, the shark bleeds, causes the feeding frenzy, allows the villains to escape, but also aids Captain America in its own right. And I think it's kind of a telling the telling point that this eventually leads to, you know, the uh, the the villains not sure they can trust Batroc because, hey, why did you help Captain America? And he's like, I didn't help Captain America. 
I helped us. We needed to get away. And it just, it served our best interests to work with Captain America. You know, it served our best interests to, to open up the lane. But, um, uh, we get to the, um, Kung Fu fighting episode, um, <laughs> which is also fun. And I, I, don't get me wrong. I love a good Kung Fu fighting episode. Um, but again, one of those kinds of things that where, where you do wonder if this is aging well. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we definitely lean into some, some, some very, uh, late 80s tropey elements here, I would say. Yeah. You know? But at least that wasn't like a, that wasn't like a huge part. Yeah. No, no, it, it, it's not. But, um, this is where, you know, Batrock, and again, Batrock, the nice guy is the guy who's chosen to give the instructions of where Cap should meet, uh, meet, um, Zemo. Zemo. And to give him his stones, which, again, it's one of these weird things like, why? Why should I? What? You know, even when he gets here, he's like, what are you going to do with the stones? He's like, just give them to me. I want the stones. Um, and, oh, and also throughout this, this is where we first get introduced, and this is actually in a couple issues before, we first get introduced to uh, Crossbones. Yep, he's just sitting we there watching. Yeah, yeah we, we don't get his origin. Um, although we do see that, you know, the um, the uh, psychic that Zemo has brought with them, uh, I forget his name. Um, oh, was it uh, Trist- Tristram uh, Mc- Ob- Aubrey or something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a fun name. And, um, yeah, he's, uh, you know, he says, but there are two others who are seeking the stones as well. Oh, he, it's funny because he comes back in a later story because remember during Acts of Vengeance when Magneto ca- uh, kidnaps the Red Skull, Crossbones tracks this guy down. It's like, you're going to help me find the skull or I'm going to pound you. <laughs> well, you know, it, you know, it, it's very interesting what, like, mid-level psychics do in a superheroic world. Because, like, in our world, it's like, oh, I have a vision and I sense a thing. And it's like... Okay, you know, but like, uh, you know, when you actually have like Charles Xavier, when you have a world with Charles Xavier, having like Bush League superhumanity is is always a little weird. Um, uh, but it's kind of cool the way it, it, it works out. And um, we get to the mountain, we get to the mountaintop um, where the ritual is to take place. We find out that in the coffin is Daddy Zemo. Mein Vater. And it's like, I, I, I don't know, man. I, I feel bad for Zemo because even as everything is happening, it doesn't seem like he ever picks it up. It's like, you know, the whole time he's like, dad, why do you sound funny? It's like, and, and like, meanwhile, it's the soul of Ulysses Bloodstone reborn in the body of Zemo of the d- dead body of Zemo. The original Zemo, and he's like, um, "Yeah, uh, I will destroy you all," and that kind of stuff. I thought it was just like an, like some kind of entity, other than you know the original Zemo. So you know, I thought, yeah, yeah. Well, I, well, I mean, I thought it was supposed to be Ulysses Bloodstone, but it was yeah, it was someone. Yeah, it was someone other than other than the guy who's been dead for years. And see, to me, this is, and it's funny, I guess, because as a kid reading this. Um, I did not pick up that it was another entity that because you know I kind of took it as like his father berating him. Where I have memories of this being a story about you know he brings the dead person back and they're like, why did you do this? <laughs> you, you, know? you just assumed it was the Nazi who was the who was the uh, yeah a hole. You know? Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess so. I mean, that's that's what's weird to me. You know what's what's actually what's interesting is that also. I'm remembering that there's actually a Bible story where they bring someone back and he basically does that. So, <laughs> it, where, it's, where it's like, why did you bring me back? You shouldn't have done this. This is a bad idea, you know. Um, and but yeah, but that it is the entity. But and, and again, um, when when uh, crossbow crossbones, sorry, you know, shatters the this stone again. He's still jumping in after him, saying, Vata! You know, and it's like, dude, really? <laughs> really? You're just gonna... He has issues. Go after him. Yeah, man, a lot of daddy issues. Which, you know, for what it's worth, probably isn't that different from the MCU Zemo. 
who's like, my father and parents are dead. Yeah, yeah. that looks delicious. Okay. I don't know why they see me on a podcast. I'm talking to you. And it's like, I made myself, and hey, I love that my kid made a pancake and egg for himself this morning. And now no longer needs me to make a breakfast for him. But um, <laughs> sometimes it's also a little bit like, okay, great. <laughs> Let me get back to my podcast. Uh, they're great kids. I love them. Don't get don't get me wrong. Um, uh, as it uh, as it plays out, it's 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 an interesting story um, of weird villains, you know. And it really is just weird villains. I mean, that's what I that is one thing I can say about this is that these are some of the like, and it's it's funny to me because it does really do a disservice for Zemo. In who Zemo later becomes in in the Marvel comics when he founds the Thunderbolts and all this kind of stuff, because he really comes off as just a guy with a lot of issues. But that's my take. I don't know. What's your take, Philip? I mean, except for like saving the villains, I'm like, do we really need Cap in this story? I mean, if Captain America, if Diamondback hadn't gotten Captain America on their trail, would Zemo have just ended up in the Amazon and gotten killed? Him and Batroc just got killed in the Amazon jungle. Probably. I mean, you know, that's sort of the thing about these kinds of stuff is like it's it is sort of it's it's the Indiana Jones paradox. You know, if Indy actually did nothing and the Nazis either never find the um, well, arguably they would have found um, they would have found the Ark because if Indy if Indy wasn't there. He wouldn't have been able to save both the the amulet and Marion from the Nazis. Hmm. So basically, if you don't have Indy in the story, the Nazis kill Marion and take the amulet, and then they find the Ark. Now then, yes, you have the basic plotline where they still kill themselves with the Ark, but you've also revealed to the Nazis the Ark of the Covenant and its location and... You know, they knew where the Nazis were. The Nazis could have still gone and gotten the Ark. And then maybe they just know, don't open the freaking Ark, you know? Yeah. Like, oh, that ended very poorly. Do not do that thing that they did. You know? So if, if nothing else, it takes it out of their hands, you know? Um, at least that is the theory. Ah. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah. So that is why you do need Indiana Jones. In the movie, because if he does not enter into the movie, Marion dies and the Nazis get the full amulet. So they would have found it much faster, all that kind of stuff. Oh, where was I? Okay, uh, moving right along. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's a good story. Um you know, I, I, I suppose it's, it's fun. It's, it's a it's fun, yeah. It's a fun story. Yeah, it's an, definitely an adventurous story. Um, I, I like it on a lot of levels, and like I said, I, I do think that this, for all of its weirdness, also starts building out this idea of the villains being human. Uh, that the rogues gallery actually, there are a lot more of them who are just hired goons, not specifically. You know, not specifically Hydra agents, you know, that really, you know, they can be hired by anybody and they can do their stuff for anybody. And that is an interesting concept. And that's what these characters eventually evolve into. Um, and we start and we first start seeing this with the Cap Diamondback dynamic, you know, back in the previous issues where we first introduced that. Yes, they do, in fact, have a dynamic that these are friends if you will mm -hmm. um yeah oh and yeah you know that's all very cool to me all righty um do you want to talk the scourge story or just want to leave it where, where, where we left it because yeah no that's fine that's fine yeah i mean basically if you ever wondered how uh the power broker got s so jacked he couldn't move uh basically he did it to himself it seems like you know he just he was an idiot and did something he shouldn't have ought to, and it ended poorly. So, um, okay, and thank you, Scourge, or at least one of the Scourges who also gets shocked, as you do. It's a theme. It's a theme. It's the theme show. Okay, you want to talk some comics, Phil? Yeah, let's talk some comics. Okay, I don't know if we're going to get to any... No, of course, we are an Avengers uh, podcast. 
So let's, you know what? Let's open up with uh, Ms. Marvel uh, and Venom. Yes. So this was, a, this is, I think, the last part of this arc. I guess, yeah. I guess they only really did like three parts, I think. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I don't know who Peacock Dude is, but I do have a question about Venom in this. Yes. Is Venom, who is Venom in this? That's, uh, that's Eddie Brock's teenage son. That is Eddie Brock's teenage son. Yes. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Because he seems very much like uh, We Are Venom kind of stuff here. Oh, let me see. Can I tell that that's a teenage kid? Uh, it's hard to see. I was going to say, I did guess... he ever take the suit off? Or... Yeah, was... There's one scene, like right here, yeah. where the sonic blast sort of pulls it back. All you really see is his back and his hair, so it could yeah. be a teenager. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, that's. So, that, so it could be that that is a teenager. So I think. Yeah. But I think you are right, because that was more like Venom. No. Well, this is the new Venom. The new Venom, because Eddie Brock's off being the King in Black or something like that, and so his son Eddie Brock Jr. I guess is the new Venom. And uh, Black Hawk, is he still anti-Venom? He is still anti-Venom. We'll get to him. He's over in Savage Avengers right now. Um. Yeah, but basically, uh, the Venom can track the part of them that has been stolen by the evil, evil people trying to make immortality a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, because apparently, they like they want uh, the because this is the big reveal is that like if they had just infiltrated the X Men, they could have figured out how they got their immortality. Oops. And the answer is, they're all just clones, man. They're all just clones all the way down. And honestly, it is weird when, and again, like I said, because this is this idea. Like, if you assume, because here's the thing. This universe has an afterlife. And yet your corporal soul can transfer. But at the same time, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm, I, I worry about this. It seems like, again, this kind of thing where all of these superheroes are in their perspective afterlives. And they were just all going to show up. They're like, oh, no, man, I died like 10 years ago. What are you talking about? It's This is just a clone of me. But um, what is this guy's name? The, uh, oh, I forget his name. But yeah, but he's got like the little peacock feather armbands and all that kind of stuff. And he's hired a doctor, a mad scientist to do the work. We have that the person that was actually gaining it was this person dying of cancer, but he's also a super genius, and he injects himself with the formula, and of course, as you might imagine, it ends poorly for him. Yes. Um, do not randomly inject stuff into yourself until it's been tested on mice, people, okay? Well, that is probably what might have happened, and you go, oh, I don't think this is safe for humans yet. Do not go directly to human testing. And, of course, the guy liquefies. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's what you should do. But, you know, and, of course, Venom gets his little bit of Venom back. But there's still... I believe that is true. That does seem to be a rule. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear Tristan talking. A little bit, yeah. A little, okay. Yeah, you're, you're at a bad angle for the mic, Tristan, so... Don't worry about it. Just stay out of the business. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the, and then we get the whole band back together. So we got Moon Knight, Wolverine, and, uh, Venom. Um, cause, I guess cause they're popular characters. And then they make a bunch of, uh, basically bulky monsters. And. Well, well I think, uh, didn't, didn't they both say in their parts like, oh yeah, let me know if you track down whoever's behind this, you know. Yeah. Um, well, did, yeah, did we, do they, oh no, well they meet them. So yeah, they see, they see the guy in the green. And his green, half green, half white henchmen. Um, they're all very mysterious. Uh, but they, ba- but the the mad scientist basically says, "Oh yeah, there is a there's something that I don't know. It might cure them. It was supposed to cure them, but they also weren't supposed to turn into cancer monsters. So you know, what do I know? Oops. And for what it's worth, of all the them going after all these people, why did they not go to Deadpool?" Like, of all the people that, like, have, like, the best healing factors, like, wouldn't Deadpool be the best one to go to? Now, yes, granted, his cells are very necrotic, but, you know, so you do. But they do apparently cure the subjects, um, 
They arrest the mad scientist, and then, you know, they, they tell Eddie that he, that, or he tells, Ms. Marvel tells uh, Venom that Eddie would be proud of him. Mm-hmm. And we get the end thing about how, you know, it's important to give people nice words. And that was a sweet story. I enjoyed it. I like, you know, I, I find Ms. Marvel a delight. Mm-hmm. Uh, not yet. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Philip, give me another story. Uh, Iron Man? 23? Iron Man? What happened with Iron Man this week? Oh, you didn't read Iron Man. Uh, no, I, I did not. It's interesting because they're trying to infiltrate this uh, whole weapons ring. And uh, remember they sent in... Uh, that Carl, <laughs> who who gets who gets shot with these uh, was shot with some kind of time time ray, and they're like, "Oh no, we lost him!" You know, he could be anywhere in time. So Tony and Rhodey are trying to put an end to this whole thing. But then, uh, so Tony has to meet with Spy Master, and he's like, "You know, I don't want to buy all this, you know, exotic weaponry before it falls in the wrong hands. What do you care? Money's money, but." Carl's back as force. He's like, yes, they sent me back in time a week and showed me how you just used and manipulated me, Tony. So, Oh, no. And they're like, yep, now you're done because you wanted those Mandarin rings. Well, guess what? The Cobalt Man already bought them. Dang it. Cobalt Man. Ah. <laughs> Curse you, Cobalt. Cobalt. Cobalt Man. Um, well, um. Do you want to talk Savage Avengers? Sure, yeah. Um, so this is the, not the end of the arc. Well, this is the end of this arc, and sadly... I was going to say, it's it's going to keep going, but it's the end of the road for Conan, Conan yeah. yeah. Although, not really, because he continues on his Conanic adventures. Oh, yeah, yeah, it shows, yeah. And so, you know, it's entirely possible he comes back again, you know? It's like, oh, yeah, you know. I think it's more of uh, let's put him let's put him uh, back on the shelf for a while because you know I don't know I don't know about the whole rights thing but it's like yeah oh you know they're they're doing what they can um you know the Conan estate says well why don't we make our own Conan books and maybe they'll make good Conan books or maybe they'll make lousy Conan books one of the two things will happen and then they'll make a decision again because invariably that's what happens uh, they're bringing set into this universe. I am not sure how I feel about this version of Set because uh, they very hydra hydraize him, and it kind of makes me feel like, oh man, are they going to like tie Set to Hydra? Is that like a new plan that they're working on? Um, but you basically have Miles Morales, Deathlock come back, um, does a Gamma Charge on Weapon H, so that's good. You get into the big fight. Um, we find out that you know um, the light power works great with anti venom. And so Flash Thompson gets all uh, super powered by Dagger. And you see that that's problematic for, for people. Um, the Black Knight grabs the uh, Blood Sword and sort of lets himself go to the dark side. Meanwhile, uh, Dagger just says, Well, I guess I'll use this healing light to not have you be dead, Conan. No. Sure, why not? Works for me. And it actually does work, and they get into the big fight, and they realize the only way that they can get rid of a uh, set is if someone stays behind and closes the door when they all jump. So Conan doesn't get to jump, but he does get to live forever in the Hyborian Age to eventually become a king, so that's cool. And that's pretty much how it ends after they kill uh, Bolsa Doom, you know, uh, Dr. Doom's uh, grandpappy, we're going to say, just for fun. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Well, and the rest then the rest of them jumped to twenty ninety nine for our cliffhanger. Oh yeah, twenty ninety nine. Good old Frank. Was it? Is it Frank Gallows or? It, oh, I think it's just Jake Gallows. Yeah. Jake Gallows, the Punisher of twenty ninety nine. Dun dun dun. So that's exciting. So what are they gonna do? A Blade Runner uh, crossover? Yeah, maybe something. It'll be something cool, I'm sure. All righty then. Uh, any other books you want to do this week, Phil? Um, just real quick. The only other one is uh. Captain Marvel, they uh, basically close out that arc. Uh, Carol's back, but uh, the Enchantress has sent a dragon to attack the city, but little does she know it's like this young girl she's friends with, but uh, she learned the lesson that the uh, magic users uh, 
uh, we're trying to teach her or like, you know, testing her that, you know, instead of killing the dragon, Carol def- uh, basically talks it down and then, yes, finds out it's her friend. And of course, you get the whole enchantress. This isn't over yet. I'll get my revenge. So, but yes, Carol's back. Binary leaves to go back into space. So, yes, we close out that arc just in time to get a uh, what do we call that crossover? Next issue is the uh, big uh, Avengers X Men Eternals uh, crossover issue. So, because everyone has to do one of those these days. Uh, but no, Captain Marvel's been doing, is a good book, I mean, <clears throat> Kelly Tom's been doing good, I mean, come on, any book that's on Spider-Man or something that gets 41 issues and keeps going, I mean, the numbers must be there, so, I think Charlie Esser's, uh, judging a pancake right now, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's good Avengers books this week, uh, you know, like I said, Captain Marvel's good, Savage Avengers was good, Iron Man was good, again, Iron Man, Christopher Cantwell, I guess, is only getting two more issues, and then, is it Jerry Dugan taking over, I believe? So, yeah. Very cool. Um, okay, well, the only last book I got that's even tangentially uh, Avengers is Spider-Punk, Ooh. which I think is the last one of this week, of this arc, uh, where we get the punk version of the Avengers, which is Captain Anarchy, uh, Mattia Murdoch, who is the Daredevil, uh, a guy named... I think they called him Robert, uh, who is the uh, Hulk of this universe. Hulk Thrash is his thing. And again, like I said, I just I, I do enjoy a lot of these Spider Punk stories just because it is so very Saturday morning cartoony, as well as being dark and 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 depressing in its own right. So you know, it's like you know, we're punk rock man. You're the establishment, and you just don't even know Osborne. And meanwhile, Osborne is evil. Uh, they do do t- um, uh, Flash Thompson dirty in this with his with his Venom being a a, a uh, racist and all that kind of stuff. But beyond that, it's really good. They do uh, defeat Osborne again, and this time, hopefully, it sticks. And you know, the people rise up, you know, and then we all walk off into the sunset. So Aww. that was fun. Uh, Spider Punk number five. Alrighty. All right, Philip. Shall we call that a show? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. Let me do some plugs. Uh, oh, like oh, oh, good. Reach out to us. Oh, sorry. oh yeah. do you want me to do it? Okay. Let's do some plugs. All right. Yeah. Well. Yeah, well, you can do it. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yes. Sorry. All right. <laughs> Before we even get to that, next week, uh, more Captain America. Captain America four forty five through four forty eight. It's kind of like the beginning of uh, Mark Wade's run. Uh, get some returning characters, including one people thought was dead for like twenty years. So. Send us your thoughts. Email us, capesandlunatics at gmail.com, or call the voicemail, 614-382-2737. That's 614-38-CAPES. And remember, you can find Avengers Declassified on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, find links to all the various social medias and Facebook fan groups and all that fun stuff. Uh, links to the YouTube channel. Again, this episode, everything we do, uh, interviews, everything, eventually gets a video up there, so... Smash that subscribe button so you don't miss a second of anything. Smash it! Including when Lilith returns. And subscribe to the Patreon because, once again, this is a labor of love. We're paying for this out of room pocket, but 3 to $5 gets you early access to creator interviews, including the monthly Chichester chats. I got the good mic out for you guys. And superhero movie brackets. We will find the worst superhero movie of all time. And if that is not enough, get yourself some Capes and Lunatics and Capes and Lunatic Sidekicks merch. Find it all at Linktree, L-A-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Capes and Lunatics. Charlie Esser. And of course, you can always write to me in that old-fashioned email way, the way our mothers and fathers once did, at um, superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at uh, gmail.com. And, of course, follow me on the Twitter as I live-tweet things like College Bowl. It's back, kids, with Peyton Manning as host. And he is the worst. (laughs) The worst host. Oh, my God. Why would you put a football player in charge of College Bowl? Ah, man's a... Bring back Chip Beals. That's what I say. Uh, (laughs) Oh, moving right along. uh, At Charlie Esser. That's C H A R L I E E S S C R. It's the two E's in the middle. For quality. Bing!
Thank you, Maz. All right, friends. You have come through another episode of Avengers Declassified. Tune in again next week as we once again tell the tales that must be told. This podcast will self-destruct in ten seconds. Oh, yeah. Boom! Well, you know, I don't, I don't really know how long it takes for the podcast to self-destruct. But, um... But yeah, next week, Captain America's Red Skull, Cosmic Cube, and a surprise return. Till then. Ah, uh, yes. Watch his oh, vacations. Hi, I'm one of the high priests of Conchu Ray, and I have the sacred privilege of providing you, the loony listener, with a podcast honoring Marvel's very own Moon Knight. So join me and a host of others at Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or support the show by becoming a Patreon member. Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast. It's time to get your conchu on.